Welcome back to another episode of our Eagle Perspective podcast. Today, we are going to be talking to two of my favorite people on campus. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that or not, but we're going to be talking about growing in faith, a term that we use a lot. And I think sometimes people aren't always sure what it means. And so we're going to explore that today. I am joined by two members of our Bible department, uh, Mr. Augustus Garcia. Augustus, how long have you been here at Santa Fe? This is year number two zero, 20, 20 years. years. Yeah, wow. It's a little bit of a milestone. Okay. So you started here when I was like five years old. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you had just graduated I high school. I barely missed you. I did not get the Augustus Garcia experience, unfortunately. Uh, but I do now as a colleague, uh, which I love. So thank you so much for being here for this topic. And then I'm also joined by a member of not one, but two departments on campus, both math and Bible, Mrs. Joy Stevenson. Joy, it's really good to have you. Good to be here. And you've been here for how long now at Santa Fe? This is the end of my 12th year. Okay, wow, congratulations. All right, so let's start with just the term itself, right? Growing in faith. Comes up a lot in our discussions. I think we were all in a meeting about retreats earlier this week and we used one of the goals was growing in faith. It's something that really in all of our strategic conversations, we use that term. What does it mean? What does it mean to grow in faith? The, the first thing I think of when, when you talk about growing in faith is, is you just look back at all of the different stories that Jesus taught to his disciples about growth. You think of the kingdom of God, which is like a mustard seed that's planted in the ground. And it's this tiny little seed of faith. And, and this mustard seed actually comes up a couple of times in Jesus's teachings, right? And I think the overriding theme of, of both of those instances, the way he uses it, is that our part is so small, so insignificant. And it's the process of, of that seed that goes into the ground that grows and becomes the largest garden plant or the, the yeast that works through the dough and, and becomes the most important thing in life. And um, in both those instances, what it's all about is this perspective of a lifelong journey of faith that none of us, when we first come to know the Lord, are completely sanctified a big theological word, right? We are justified. In other words, Jesus paid the price for our sin. We are complete and whole in him. But that just begins this journey. And the, the journey is, is lifelong. I, I would say it's eternal, right? Um, and the kingdom of God ultimately starts with that single small seed of faith and we have to have that perspective of this is our life. Uh, it's a journey that we're on in Christ that, that never ends and goes up and down and sideways and around different corners and bends and takes some unexpected turns for sure. But ultimately, it's, it's the Holy Spirit um, working in us that is growing us to be conformed into his likeness. Wow, so there's a lot there to, to, to unpack. Joy, I want to get your take on this too. What what would you say, growing in faith, I mean, what does that mean? Um, I believe for me to grow in my faith is to say yes to God whenever an opportunity comes in my life, um, to trust Him above trusting what might seem the world might be saying to me. For example, I really didn't want to move out here to California. That was a huge step of faith for me. I graduated from Olivet Nazarene University in Bourbonnet, Illinois, and I wanted to go to Africa and wow. teach at an orphanage in Navasha, Kenya. And God closed that door for me. I'm like, wait, what? You like don't want me to go to Africa and teach, you know, young people math and and um, God said, no, like, I want you to go to California and I want you to get your master's at SDSU and I want you to pursue math education. And I was really, I went to California really kicking and screaming. God just showed himself to me in that decision of, I'm going to prepare you to be the best math teacher that you can be. And then he opened the door for me to be here at Santa Fe Christian School a few years later. And I'm so thankful that I did say, Say yes to God in getting my master's because it was that opportunity that opened the door here at Santa Fe, but also it's made me the best math teacher that I can be and to glorify him through that. And it was 
pretty obvious what God was doing in those moments. Um, I could not deny that. So yeah, I think it's just about continuing to say yes to God and trusting His plan over your own and knowing that He has a purpose behind that yes and knowing that you don't know everything ahead of time. Like I didn't know what would come out of my yes, but what has come has been so beautiful and I, I could not have written a better story myself. So you're both, both of your answers are, are getting at, you know, this inter- interesting thing with, with growth in faith. So you're kind of talking about things like saying yes to God or knowing that I don't know everything, right? And, and Augustus, you talked about a lifelong process. And so that feels a little more abstract or a little more, you know, it's not just, well, growing in faith means, you know, A, B, C, X, Y, Z. Am I, am I characterizing that accurately? Well, I, I think that um, that really hits on the idea that our growth process and faith in Christ is not compartmentalized to one area of our life. It is everything. In other words, it, it encompasses all areas of our life. So in terms of abstract, in other words, growth in Christ means your relationship with your kids, with your church, with your friends. Uh, with your interior journey, with your thoughts, with it's not, I think um, one of the mistakes that we sometimes make is we think that to follow or to grow in our faith just means, you know, we got to read our Bible, we need to go to church, and if I've checked off these spiritual boxes, then I'm automatically going to be growing in, in, in faith. So yeah, it is not, I, w- I wouldn't say abstract, it's more holistic mm. than just a, a list of, of do's and don'ts. And yet, how do we explain that or express that or bring that out of students? Because I feel like, you know, for that, there's a lot of students who go to, well, if I'm growing in faith, I must be doing X, Y, Z, learning X, Y, Z, thinking X, Y, Z, saying X, Y, Z, right? Um, how do you work with students to get them to see this more holistically? I really am trying to encourage um, my students to really have an attitude or an, a thought process of surrendering all of their selves to, to God and to Christ. And I think it's in that surrender that all of the other things fall under. So if I'm going to surrender all of myself to God, then I'm surrendering my hope and success in this sport. I'm surrendering this relationship I might be having with friends, I'm surrendering my habits, my routines. And if, if we're under that umbrella of giving to God all of it, not just prioritizing God's first. No, God is all. God is everything. Um, and then that would be a holistic approach to share with my students so that they can see that as I make these decisions, am I glorifying God? Am I showing that I am His in whatever decision it might be for them? There's almost a part of that too that is like meeting students in their place of failure, right? Like I like I almost feel like, you know, maybe you start out with sort of like, well, yes, I'm going to make the right decisions and, and I'm going to believe the right things. I'm going to do the right things, which is all great. But then what happens when I don't get the grade I want in the class I need and I think my my future is at stake yeah. right yeah. like that's that moment of mm-hmm. surrender mm-hmm. where you know you can almost connect with a student and say this is what we're talking about yeah. right is this moment i just wanted to to build on on what joy was was saying in the way in which we we bring students into the conversation of what it means to be a follower of Christ in all of the different activities and classes that that they're in. Um, I, I think that's one of the, the key things of shifting perspective for students. One of the beauties of, of Santa Fe is that you have Christian coaches, you have Christian artistic directors of programs, and, and it's bringing them into this perspective that Christ is the center of all. It's not how to do mathematics Christianly or how to do science Christianly or how to do art Christianly. It's it's you are a Christian. I, I keep coming back to this holistic, trying to inspire students to see the fact that Christ desires to be a part of their whole life. Nothing is outside. Nothing that is school, outside. Right. It's That's not. It's not my spiritual life and then my academic life. Right. It's all the same thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the 
the lifelong nature of it, Augustus. So, you know, there's there's sort of this question, I guess, what should we expect in terms of spiritual growth from a graduate of Santa Fe? You know, are they supposed to be fully grown <laughs> at age 18? We have these, you know, I mean, what do we look for? I think that a lot of 18-year-olds probably think that adults expect them to be fully arrived by the time they yeah. receive their diploma. And that's one thing that Rod Gilbert has mentioned a number of times that I appreciate, that we're not here graduating seminarians. We're not graduating fully formed human beings. We're graduating 18-year-olds. And for any of us who have been alive longer than that, we can look back on our lives and realize we had not arrived then. We have probably not arrived where we are because by this time in our adulthood, we realize it's a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's that unfortunate pressure, I think, that gets placed on, on kids growing up to think that they're supposed to have arrived at perfection, um, full sanctification by the time that they've graduated high school. That's part of the process is, is learning how Christ comes in and dusts you off when you, when you fail. In fact, I would say that's probably the key part of the process of, of learning how Christ picks us up in our failures because that's, that's when we learn that we can trust him and that he still loves us and places us back on our feet and says, now let's let's move forward. So what are some things that that maybe you do in your classroom or in your relationships that, you know, push kids towards this kind of growth or this kind of way of thinking? I mean, how how are you intentional about this? So this has really been um, a beautiful year for me personally in this exact area. By the grace of God, I've seen such beautiful fruit come from this labor of love, junior Bible seminar, uh, ladies only class. And so last year was the second year that um, JBS ladies only was offered. And my first year, we had eight amazing juniors back in 2018 sign up. And then last year, 2019, 2020, we had 33 girls sign up. And so I had of the three groups, two groups wanted to continue to meet. Mm -hmm. And I saw two leaders rise up. And in my first group, a young lady decided to host Bible studies at her house on the weekends once a month. And it was really good for the soul. We met outside, we had Bible studies, the girls led them themselves. So that was so cool to like just be there to watch them grow and experience what it was like to lead a Bible study and to just give them that extra support that they needed when that time came. And, and then another young lady came in January and said, I'd like to do the same thing and host at my house as well. And they we're like, we, we would really like to hear you speak on certain topics. It's ranged from how we love our enemies. Mm -hmm. We talked about when they go off to college, how do they share their faith in a genuine way? And then tomorrow we're going to meet up at the beach and we're going to talk about prayer and what does prayer look like? What does it mean? Why is it important? And so I'm super excited to have these small moments in these young ladies' lives to to really just be vulnerable, be transparent, be open, just enjoy fellowship and talking with them about their questions. They have a lot of questions. Yeah. So this has been an amazing gift and um, God has been glorified through it all and it's really cool to see their growth. So just to make clear to our listeners at home, tomorrow is a Saturday. Oh, tomorrow's a Saturday. So you're not pulling them from school to Definitely go to the beach not. less than anyone. Of course not. Think. I would never think of but, that. But you know, your, your, your statement there <laughs> Uh, saying that is the guy who's in charge of attendance. Yeah. Right? Your statement there about growth is not about necessarily finding the right answer as much as like figuring out how to wrestle through the questions. Right. So I, I'm curious because one of the things about growth is it's really hard to measure. Like we don't know, you know, fully who's growing and who's not. And also when it's going to happen and how fast, you know, we're to so go back to your seeds, Augustus. We're just right. sometimes planting seeds, right? So do either of you have any examples of someone that, you know, maybe you weren't sure where they were at at all spiritually. And then, you know, down the road, you come to find out that, you know, actually there was there was quite a bit of growth that you didn't know about or a growth that happened later that you didn't know about. Yeah, I think my my teaching career is, is just sprinkled with all sorts of those types of stories because 
one of the things that is difficult to as a teacher is you often don't see much of the fruit <clears throat> during your time in high school. I mean, you do, and and you celebrate those those close relationships that you have or, or those triumphs. But I can think of uh, one kid in particular that. <laughs> In, he, he was he was certainly a, a handful throughout uh, his time in my class, and yet also the life of the party always. And and I think that's what it often comes down to is is trying to mentor students in their relationships with one another. Because at the end of the day, that's that's ultimately where a lot of the the growth in one's faith as a teenager is is real for them in how they are responding to their peers and understanding when they've when they've hurt and wounded other people. Um, and then finding growth in that, right? And then to, to find out five years down the road, I mean, he's a youth pastor now. It's like, wait, what's going on there? You know what I mean, and you're probably thinking, oh, that one guy. No, there's multiple kids that, that actually I'm thinking of that fit that, that paradigm. But coming back to that, that idea of how to help kids navigate relationships in, in high school, and, and that's the beauty of, of having... The, the coaches, the teachers, yeah. the uh, deans of students that <laughs> come along into their lives. Uh, it reminds me of the, the passage in, in Romans 12 where, where Paul says, if at all possible, live at peace with all men as far as it depends on you. And I, and I think that's one of the most difficult challenges for, for teenagers is there's always drama. I mean, there's there's always drama to navigate, and and so many wounded hearts and 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 things that the kids navigate through through high school, and and oftentimes the the fruit of that that growth is not until they leave and reflect. But yeah, many many stories like that for sure. It is a real big blessing when you have a student that you know struggled with their faith, and then a few years later you get an email. And that email just shares, like, thank you for being there during those difficult years. Thank you for encouraging me and loving on me and knowing that the seeds that were planted while they were here, they were not on deaf ears. They were not to blind eyes. They were definitely seen and heard. That message was seen and heard. And our hope is that it would continue to grow. And again, growth looks very different for all people. (laughs) It looks so different. And so just knowing that God has his eye on that student. God has his ears to their prayers and trusting God with that student and surrendering that student to God and knowing that God has a plan and um, I have to trust that plan for that student and know that I was in that student's life for a brief moment but for a reason and so those are some really cool emails when you get them. It's just a good reminder that you know there's not a recipe for what it looks like necessarily you know while they're here it could look a lot of different ways. One other thing that I I was thinking of what is it that I I want so earnestly to um, import into the lives of of my own kids and my students and, and what makes that difference and I think, I think it has to do with the fact that we are called to love as God loves us. And what that means is that we love unconditionally. And I can think of the conversations with, with students and with uh, my, my own kids when you have difficult conversations, when they're going through the hot mess of life or they've made their hot mess on themselves and you have to speak those words of truth you have to speak those words of of discipline that it's always accompanied with that unconditional love the reminder that i am expressing these concerns to you not out of condemnation but out of love and i don't want you to fail my class (laughs) <laughs> because I love you. I don't want to, I'm giving you this detention because I love you. I know you must have that. And that's, that's sort of the, the foundation of Absolutely. your job, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Is to leave students and every person that you come into contact with, that the foundation of my interaction with you is for you to have a, a taste of God's love that no matter what you do, no matter how far you stray, no matter what you've done in life, that that foundation of love and acceptance is there. Um, And that is right there to the heart of the gospel, that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Unconditional love 
right? We, we explain that, we say that, everybody's on board with that, conceptually, right? <laughs> right. And in a way, our job is to, to sort of remind our students when they're going through things or when there's that person that is really, or whatever, right, who's upset them. It's, hey, this is, this is unconditional love, right? This is the hard part of it. And to continually point that out and remind them, if we say we believe in this thing, this is what that means, right? You have to love in this situation right now that you don't want to. I always start my class with prayer. And I ask my students, okay, you know, I'm like, good morning, class. And they're like, good morning, Mrs. Stevenson. And then I'm like, do you all have any prayer requests? I'm very consistent about doing that because I want them to know, one, that I care about what's going on in their life besides if they did their math homework or not. And two, that God also cares and that we can come to God as a community, as brothers and sisters in Christ and pray over their prayer requests. And then it allows me to follow up with them later on, like, hey, how is your grandpa doing? And it's really sweet to, to hear their prayer requests. Um, most of the time they are praying for their family members, um, which is just really sweet and endearing. So I do want them to know that prayer is really important. Also, that community is really important. I think that's a huge building block that the Bible encourages us to continue to gather together. Fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ is so important because it allows us to encourage one another, to keep each other accountable, to help when life throws you a hot mess. And we all know life is gonna throw us a hot mess one way or the other. And so in those times, we need to call on our brother or sister in Christ and ask for help because that's one of the ways God reaches us is through each other. And if you're not in a community and you're not with fellow believers, that's a way that you've stripped God reaching or helping you or talking to you. So it's really important not to be in isolation. And then definitely going back and reading my word, reading the Bible and knowing like, what does God say about this topic? What, how does God want me to live? And it's in that coming back to God every day that God will whisper his tender love and mercy to me. So there's a couple things that, that hit me in, in what you say and making sure God is a part of those struggles, mm. right? Like that is not outside of the umbrella of what God wants to be a part of, right? Right. It's in, and I, part of me feels like if our kids leave with that, that, mm. you know, yeah, you're going to have difficulties, but if you make God a part of that struggle of trying to figure out what's going on, if you make community part of that struggle, right, right, um, you know, you're going to grow. To tie back to something Augustus said earlier, that term unconditional love, I mean, we throw that around all the time, but what does that mean? Unconditional love is a love that will stand the test of time, stand the test of actions and words. When my students break a rule or I can go to them in love and say, you know, what you did was unacceptable. And obviously I do it privately and with respect and honor and it was unacceptable and that this behavior needs to stop. Uh, because I love you and I want you to be in my class when class is happening. Or this needed to be turned in because this was part of the curriculum. Whatever have you, it, the situation. But taking that time to talk to that student and express to them, the behavior was unacceptable, but I still love you. And the reason I'm calling you out on it is because I love you. In the Bible, it says God disciplines those he loves. We are his children. He loves us. He disciplines us. Um, I have a five-year-old, and um, I remember, you know, during COVID, he, when we were all at home, he was outside playing, and he just ran out the driveway and into the street, and here I am, get back in the driveway, and screaming my head off, because I don't know if a car is going to come or whatnot, and um, I discipline him because I love him. I want him to be safe. I want him to um, not get hurt, obviously. And so just like I have to discipline my child so that he doesn't get hurt in the street and not run in the street, so God has to discipline us because he loves us and he knows that the things that we might partake in are not good for us. 
Hence why he doesn't want us to participate in them. Just like we know our students, if they're partaking in something or behaving a certain way, it's not healthy for them. It's not good for them. Therefore, we call them out in love. So yeah, unconditional love means no matter what you're doing, I'm going to be looking out for you. Be safe and glorify God in, in what you're doing. So in a way, you know, the, the, the fact that I love you is not dependent on your actions. That doesn't mean that you get to do whatever you want and I always agree with it or feel great about it or think that you're right or but it does mean that because I love you, I'm we're going to we're going to talk about those things. We're, but my kindness, my my generosity towards you, all the things God calls me to be towards you, I am regardless, right? In some ways that's that's God's call to us and his charge to us. Very well said. Unconditional love is not conditional on your behavior. It's contingent upon my relationship to you. And and God's love is contingent not upon our sin, not upon our behavior, but it's contingent upon Jesus Christ and what he did for us. In the same way that my love for my own children is not contingent upon what they do in life, no matter what they do, no matter, I'm not going to love them anymore. No matter what they do, I'm not going to love them any less. It's contingent on the fact that I'm their father. And in the same way, our love for, for our brothers and sisters in Christ is the same way. Our, our love for, my love for you is not contingent on the fact that you have a witty sense of humor um, and know how to it make me laugh. A it helps bit. a little yeah. bit, <laughs> but it's contingent upon the fact that you are created in the image of God and when I see you, I need to treat you as I would treat Christ, um, a brother and, and sister in Christ. So looping back around to our interactions with students, that I think is probably the hardest thing for students to, to comprehend because there is discipline in the Lord, as you were just saying, Joy. There are consequences to our behavior, but those don't affect the condition of God's love for us, and they ought not affect the condition of the love that we have for brothers and sisters in Christ. I believe that's the foundational stone that that helps to water that that seed of faith, and will eventually make it make it grow, and leads to that lifetime of growth. Absolutely. Well, thank you both for being here. I really enjoyed this conversation. And thank you to those of you at home for uh, listening to another episode of our Eagle Perspective podcast. Feel free to check out uh, additional episodes on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, or other places where podcasts are available. We'll be back with you again soon. 